Genesis chapter 1. And I want to read just a couple verses. This is just laying the groundwork for where we're going over the next few minutes. I've got 45 minutes for this plane to take off, cruise, and land. 45 minutes. Genesis chapter 1, starting with verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And let me say this, let me say this before I get too far into this message. Uh, we celebrate Father's Day. We also want to recognize that today is the celebration that is new to a lot of people. It's called Juneteenth. And what Juneteenth is, it is not the elimination of slavery. Uh, that had been done through the Emancipation Proclamation. But it was a group of people that, a group of slaves that had not heard the news that they were free. They were free, but didn't know it. And today is the celebration of when the news reached the last group of slaves in America with the announcement, you're no longer slaves. Today you are free. You are free men. You are free women. And we celebrate that today. I'm, I'm thankful that I don't live in a country that it, we're not perfect. But thank God we're not what we used to be. And isn't that the story of all of our lives? That we're not what we used to be. And, and what today makes me realize is that there are still a lot of people, your neighbors, people you work with, that freedom has been purchased for them and they don't know it yet. And we are the messengers that have been sent with the good news that Jesus Christ has died and paid for your freedom. All chains have been broken. All prisons have been opened. Today you are free. And whom the sun sets free is free indeed. So I wanted to make sure I recognize that today. Verse 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Verse 2, the earth was without form and void. Darkness was over the face of the deep. Here's what I want to draw your attention to. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Hovering. I want you to get this image that all the way back in the beginning, we get the first mention of the Holy Ghost. And he is hovering, hovering. Just get that image of him hovering over that void in darkness. Lord, bless the reading of your word today. Let it change somebody's life is my prayer in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. Three weeks ago, we celebrated a day called Pentecost. Now, Pentecost just means 50 days after the Sabbath that follows Passover. Now, there are some people that believe that Pentecost, that celebration, ended with the death of the last apostle. But yet, they believe that the Passover can still be recognized in their lives. We still, every one of us, recognize the Passover in our lives, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We believe that the, we can experience a Passover. So if I can experience a Passover where the Lamb takes my place, then why can't I also experience Pentecost? Why can't I receive the infilling of the Holy Ghost? The answer is, you can. If you can experience Passover, you can experience Pentecost. But when you begin to talk about Pentecost, when you begin to use words like charismatic, when you begin to use phrases like speaking in tongues, filled with the Holy Ghost, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, People get a little nervous, uh, especially in churches like ours where you never know what's going to happen on a Sunday. Now, I personally enjoy that. I, I have a lot of fun in Holy Ghost services. I, I, I just, I couldn't get in with the stand up, kneel, stand up, kneel, cross, stand up, kneel, stand up, repeat after me, repeat after me. That would be, that would get, that'd be tough for me. I have too, too short of an attention span. But man, when you come into a service where somebody's jumping on this side, somebody's crying on this side, there's somebody rolling in the floor over here, somebody's speaking in a language you ain't ever heard before over here, I can get with that. That's, that's exciting, church. But the world has tried to give the Holy Ghost a bad name. Let me tell you a couple quick things about the Holy Ghost. First off, the Holy Ghost is God. He is not a third-class, watered-down version of God. 
It is not the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. No, it is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Three in one. And he is God. The Bible is clear that the Holy Spirit is God. Number two, the Holy Ghost is our helper. The Greek word is parakletos. It means one who walks beside us. He is a person. You can know him personally. And the Bible goes on to say that he is a comforter. Oh, have you ever needed comfort? Have you ever needed, been through a, a difficult time or a difficult season and you just needed comfort? Well, I got good news for you. The Holy Ghost, he's your comforter. And not just that, he's your guide. Uh, the book of Isaiah, I believe it is, said that you will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. That's the beauty of knowing and having a relationship with the Holy Ghost. You'll go to make a, a business decision and the Holy Ghost will say, don't get involved in that. You need to be over here. You'll go to get in a relationship and the Holy Ghost will say, that's not the person for you. I got somebody better. Don't worry about being lonely. Don't be afraid about being lonely. You may be lonely for a season, but it's better to have a, a relationship that lasts a lifetime and he'll guide you. But the Holy Spirit, I love this. How does he help us? He prays through us. That there are going to be seasons you don't, you ever been in a situation where you just didn't know how to pray about it? I mean, it was so bad, you couldn't come up with the words to pray. The Bible says, he will pray through you with groanings that cannot be uttered. The Bible also says that the Holy Ghost is our friend. Now, if you tell, if you tell me, Pastor Eric, you're my friend, and we go to a party, and then all of a sudden people see you with me, and you start telling people, I don't know who he is. I don't know him. He followed me in here. I've never met him before. We're not friends. And if you tell people that the Holy Ghost is weird, he's not your friend. Because the Holy Ghost is not weird. He's wonderful. He is my friend. I'm not ashamed of him. I don't want him to stay outside today because we have important people in the service. Holy Ghost, we may have dignitaries in the room. Can you please just wait out back? Holy Ghost, we have athletes in the room today. We have celebrities in the room today. Would you, would you care, Holy Ghost, just to wait in my office till the service is over? No, let me tell you, my allegiance to him is greater than my allegiance to anybody else. I want him on the platform, up front. It's his service. It's his day. That's why I pray, Holy Ghost, have your way. Because he's not weird. Now, is, when, a Holy Ghost, when the Holy Ghost begins to move, will people say, what in the world is going on? Yes, but that's good. What that's creating in them is a desire to know more. I want you to explain to me what is going on in that room. Well, let me tell you what's going on in this room. He is a person. He is our helper. He is our comforter. He is our friend. He's not weird. But it is Satan's plan to have people misunderstand and misrepresent the Holy Ghost. Why would the enemy work so hard to make people afraid of the Holy Ghost? Why would he work so hard? There must be something the devil knows about the Holy Ghost that we don't. And that is when he steps in the room, the devil has to step out. Because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So I entitled this message today, Love the Dove. Look at somebody and tell them, Love the Dove. Love the Dove. Long for the Dove. Pray for the dove. John chapter 1, Jesus, wanting to fulfill all scripture, begins to make his way down to the Jordan River. There's his cousin John, the baptizer, and he is baptizing with water. He doesn't see Jesus yet, but he starts telling people about Jesus because John was a voice in the wilderness preparing the way for the Messiah who would come after him. 
And John begins to tell the people, I'm not the Messiah. But there is one who will come after me whose shoes I'm not worthy to untie. And he will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And while John was yet speaking, he looked up and he saw his cousin Jesus. And he said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And Jesus didn't stop at the crowd. Jesus made his way right down into the water. And he says, I need to be baptized. And John said, oh, no, 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 you need to be baptized in me. And Jesus said, no, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And John took Jesus and he baptized him in the water. And when Jesus came up out of the water, I want you to watch this beautiful picture that takes place here. The Bible says that the heavens opened and there was a voice from heaven and it spoke and said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. As far as we know, Jesus hasn't done anything yet. He's not healed anybody sick. The first miracle, the wedding at Canaan hasn't taken place yet. There's been no miracles performed. But yet the father is proud of his son. Dads, do not miss the message in what God the father did. He was prophesying greatness into his son. I'm not going to wait for you to do something before I tell you I'm proud of you. I'm going to tell you I'm proud of you before you do anything worth being proud of. Because I know there's a future in front of you that's going to make me more proud than I could ever imagine. Take, take that example of the Heavenly Father. Praise your kids in advance. Praise your, don't make them live up to your expectations. Praise them in advance. They can't walk yet. Well, brag on them anyways. Greatest son, greatest daughter I've ever seen. I'm so proud of you. I'm so, I tell my kids as often as I can, I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you. Your dad is proud of you because I want them to know you don't have to earn the accolades of the world. Just come back home because you got a daddy who's proud of you. And if you didn't have that earthly father in your life, like Pastor Kim said, that's why you need a local church because you're surrounded by people in this place that will tell you we are proud of you. We're not jealous of you. We're not envy of you. We're here to celebrate you. We're proud of you. And then something beautiful happens. So heaven's open. The father speaks. And John said, and the Holy Spirit descended like as a dove, and it landed upon Jesus. And John says, it remained upon him. The Holy Ghost came down. Now Jesus was filled with the Spirit. But here we have an instance of the Holy Ghost landing on him and remaining on him. It didn't leave him. Now Luke tells us what happens next. The Spirit leads him into the wilderness where he'll be tempted for 40 days. But afterwards, having resisted temptation, he will come out in the power of the Spirit. And he will stand up to read. And he finds a place where it is written in Isaiah, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me for you. The Holy Ghost is in me for me. But the Holy Ghost comes on me for you. And you need to recognize the difference of the Holy Ghost being in you and when the Holy Ghost overshadows you, when the Holy Ghost comes on you. When you feel the presence of the anointing come on your life, start looking around because there's somebody that needs that anointing. 
Don't deny that anointing. Don't push away that anointing. Step into that anointing. God, I know you're in me. You never leave me. You never forsake me. When I wake up in the morning, the Spirit is in me. When I go to sleep, the Spirit is in me. When I sleep at night, the Holy Ghost is in me. My body is the temple of the Holy Ghost wherein the presence of God dwells. I know the Holy Ghost is in me, but there are those unique moments where I feel the Holy Ghost come on me. And when he is on me, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to heal the brokenhearted, to set at liberty them that are captive, to preach the acceptable news, the acceptable year of the Lord. He's on me. There's a reason he just came on me. He came on me because somebody needs to be healed. He came on me because somebody needs to be delivered. He came on me because somebody needs to be saved. He came on me because fear is about to be driven out of somebody's life. He came on me because an addiction is about to be broken off of somebody's life. And I'm not going to push him away no he landed on me because there's a need and what you got to become sensitive to is that presence coming on you and when it comes on you don't push it away start looking God why 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 Lord I just felt the anointing why why are you on me God because somebody needs a miracle the woman with the issue of blood reaches out and touches the hem of Jesus' garment and he stops. People are thronging him. They are pressing in on every side. One woman touches the hem. Virtue leaves him and he stops and he says, who touched me? And all the disciples go, Lord, you're kidding us. Everybody's touching me. He said, no, no, no. They're touching me, but only one person touched what's on me. And you can touch somebody without touching what's on somebody. And you don't need to touch the person. What you need to get a hold of is what's on the person. But she had such a hunger for what was on Jesus that she was able to access what nobody else was able to access. That's the way. This is the reason. Why people can be in the same service and some people get a miracle and some people leave just like they walked in the room because some people came to touch a person but there's some people who said, I gotta get a hold of what's on that person. I gotta get a hold of the anointing that's overshadowing that person. I got a need today and my need is my... Somebody give Jesus a big praise. Say it, the Holy Ghost is in me, for me. The Holy Ghost is on me. Now look at somebody, for you. He's in me, for me. The Holy Ghost does not make you better than other people. The Holy Ghost makes you better than you. So he's in me, for me. It's the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is for me. Love, joy, peace. You know, you know the fruit of the Spirit. That's, that's in me to make me better than me. But on me. Because God's got something for you. This is why some, this is why you can put the same preacher in front of multiple congregations. And some congregations, he just, he just struggles to preach. He just struggles to get the word out. And other congregations, you, have to, you almost have to carry him out on a gurney because they just got everything they could out of him. Don't ever let a preacher just preach at you. When that man or woman of God stands up on that stage, say, God, I'm going to get everything they got on their life today. I am going to wring them dry before they walk out of this place. They may have walked in here, but they're going to carry him out because, God, I'm going to get everything he's got on the inside. I'm going to get everything he's got on the outside. I'm going to get everything you got on his life. So here is the image. And nobody, the greatest illustration I've ever seen of this was Pastor Bill Johnson, the pastor of Bethel Church. And he said, he said, just see this, this dove coming down and landing on Jesus. And he said, it remained. I got a dove back here. He's chill. But I promise you, he's in there. 
if that dove, if I took that dove out and I put him on my shoulder, how would I walk through this room if I didn't want him to fly away? How would I walk through this room? Here's what Pastor Bill Johnson said. Every step would be with the dove in mind. How do you keep the presence of the Holy Ghost in and on your life? Every step is with the dove in mind. Do you feel the dove in here right now? I feel the presence of God in this room right now because somebody just got a revelation. When you enter into a conversation, do it with the dove in mind. When you're getting ready to go somewhere, do it with the dove in mind. (laughs) Whatever you do, imagine me walking through the lobby today and as I'm talking with people, I'm doing it with the dove. Every step, every step is with that dove in mind. You wanna know how you and I are supposed to live? Everything we do, we should be thinking about the dove. We should love the dove. Love the dove in such a way that we never want him to leave our life. We don't want him to leave our home. We don't want to conduct your house with the dove in mind. I heard a story about um, missionaries in other countries and there were, some, there were some tribes that the gospel was just getting to, and this was in Africa, and they had this practice to tell whether or not the missionary was a fraud. When the missionary got to their little village and they gave him his little hut or whatever they had for him to stay in, they took a dove and they put the dove in his little hut. If the dove flew out, they knew he was a fraud. If the dove stayed in the house with him, they knew he was a man of God. I wonder how many of us today, if we'd go home and open our windows, the dove would go flying out. Because the way you talk in here is not the way you talk at home. And the way you act in here is not the way you act at home. And the way you live in here is not the way you live at home. And the dove will tell on you. Oh, don't, oh, don't, kids, don't open the windows. We can't let the dove out. No, you're trying to trap a dove. You're not trying to love the dove. I don't want to be the, I don't want to have to trap the dove to get him to stay in my home. I want the dove to want to be in my home, live in my home. I want him to brood in my home. Why? Because my house is a house of peace. My house is a house of love. My house is a house of joy. My house is a house of prayer. My house is a house of praise. My house is a place where Jesus is exalted. And wherever Jesus is exalted, that's where the dove wants to be. I want the dove in my kids' rooms. I want the doves brooding. I want the dove brooding over them while they sleep at night. I want the dove in our living room, in our family room. I want the, I want everywhere I go when I drive down the road, I want to know the dove is on me. And when I go into work, I want to know the dove is on me. And when I come home, I want to know the dove is on me. Because I love the dove and I can't do life without God's hand on my shoulder. Somebody give Jesus a big praise. Oh, come on, if you love the dove, give him a big praise. Give him a big praise. Every step, the dove is in mind. Every step. Imagine the miracles you would see if you walked every day with the dove in mind. And you felt that dove pushing you towards somebody. And you walked up and you were their miracle because what was on you is what they needed. It's on you for a reason. Praise God. You know, doves have unique characteristics. In Genesis 1-1, see, is the Holy Ghost a dove? No, the Holy Ghost is not a dove, but... How can humans define God? How can humans describe God? So what we have to do is we have to take earthly examples and try to 
explain what it is that we see. But there is also something called a law of first mention. And whatever you see mentioned first in the Bible, it usually carries that theme throughout the Bible. So notice that the first time you see the Holy Ghost, what's he doing? He's hovering like a dove. But notice he's, he's, he's the power of God, but he's hovering. He's not doing anything. He's just hovering. What's he waiting on? The Father to say the word. And when the, whole, when the Father says the word, the dove goes into action. Can I tell you, if you feel the Holy Ghost hovering over you but not on you, it could be he's waiting for the Father to say the word, but you've not been going to the throne to get the word. You go to the throne, the Father sends the word, that's when the Holy Ghost overshadows you. So he's hovering. Now, when a dove hovers, it hovers in a unique way. This is beautiful. If you've ever seen the picture, you'll know what I'm talking about. When a dove flaps its wings, it doesn't do like other birds. Its wings sweep up towards its head because the Holy Ghost will never speak of himself, but he always speaks of the, grab that for me, he always speaks of the head of the body. The Holy Ghost does not speak of himself, but he exalts Jesus. He lifts up Jesus. He points people to Jesus. How can man be saved unless the Holy Spirit first draw him? So if, if something is going on in the church that doesn't exalt Jesus, the Holy Ghost isn't a part of it. Because the Holy Ghost will always point back to Jesus. Now notice we've got hovering in Genesis, but go forward a few chapters and you've got the story of the flood. And Noah's wondering whether or not the waters have subsided. So he opens a window and he sends out a raven, a dirty bird. But the raven, you know, Noah got tired of dealing with this raven. And he decided to let loose a dove. The dove returned. Why? Because a raven will land on dead things, not the dove. The dove only lands on living things. If you've not been made alive in Jesus Christ, you will never know what it means to have the Holy Ghost land on your life. If you are dead in your sins, dead in your trespasses, dead in your failures, the Holy Ghost will not land on that life. You must be resurrected into a new life through Jesus Christ. All things passed away, all things made new. That's when the dove lands on you. Love the dove. So Noah releases this dove. Think about this, that first flight. It's the first mention of the dove in Scripture. Think of what all the dove represents. The dove represents peace. Whenever the Holy Ghost comes into the room, there will not be chaos and confusion. Now, people may question what's going on, but that's not chaos and confusion. Whenever... I, I've watched it so many times. I've, I've, watched, I've watched people in a service and they're under the power of the Holy Spirit and they're running right at each other and at the last second turn and go different directions. And I'm like, isn't that, that's just like the Holy Ghost. Isn't that like the Holy Ghost? When, and when, when that spirit lifts off a service, you will feel peace fill the room. Why? Because he is the voice of peace. The Holy Ghost is not the voice of confusion. He is not the voice of chaos. So if there is something in your life that is causing you confusion and chaos, the Bible said that is the works of the devil. That is not the works of the Holy Ghost. When the Holy Ghost speaks, he speaks peace. Peace. The dove represents the arrival or spring or new life. We have some pigeons. A, a dove is a type of pigeon. And we have some pigeons and they make their nest right outside our bedroom window and come spring they start talking it drives Kim bonkers and she says doesn't that bother you I said no oh no no you have no idea how much I hate winter the fact that they're talking means the season's about to change 
Whenever you hear the dove start talking, that means a season in your life is about to change. A season, there's, begin, there's about to come new life. There's about to come a new beginning. There's about to become a shift. Dead things are gonna give way to life. Things that were under the surface are about to spring forth a new life. It's about to be a time of planting. It's about to be a time of harvest. The rain is coming. There's about to be a new life and a new season is on the way when the dove shows up. The dove represents purity and holiness. Purity, holiness. It's the raven that lands on dirty things, not the dove. He lands on pure things, holy things. Stop asking God to anoint a sinful life. Stop asking God to anoint Pornography. Stop asking God to anoint lying and gossip, division. Stop asking God to anoint hate. Stop asking God to anoint judgmentalism. And stop asking God to anoint all these impure things. He's not going to release the dove on something that is sinful. Well, Pastor, I got a lot of mistakes in my life. Be born again. Because in John chapter 3, Jesus gives us the most beautiful picture of how the Holy Ghost works. Oh, no, I thought John chapter 3, I thought John chapter 3 was, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. I thought that was John 3. But keep on reading. Because Nicodemus goes, how can a man enter a second time in his mother's womb? And Jesus says, by the Spirit. You have to be born again of the Spirit. If there's sin in your life, be born again. And I got a sermon I'm working on called Birthmarks. Because there's some people when they come out of the womb, they got birthmarks. And when you are born again, there's going to be some birthmarks in your life. There's going to be some things that mark your life that you're not who you used to be. You have been born again. And that's when the dove comes on you. Oh, I got, I got 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Let me, let me see if I can get through this quickly. I, I don't want to rush it. I'm taking my time today in case you haven't noticed because I'm just, just flowing in the Holy Ghost. So Jesus enters the temple. It's towards the end of his ministry. And the Bible says as he enters the temple, he sees the money changers and those selling in the temple. And they're exchanging monies, and he talks about the doves. These doves are being held in cages. Now, if you were going to go and give God an offering for your sin, it was a bull or a bullock, or if you didn't have that, maybe a lamb or a goat. But if you were in poverty, you couldn't afford anything, a penny could buy you a dove. Because God did not send his son just to save the wealthy. He sent him to save people in every stage, classification, every place in life. Jesus is for the world. And we are not supposed to keep it in cages and say, oh no, unless you're important, you can't get a hold of this. No, he's for everybody. And he walks into his temple and he sees these doves in cages. And you don't see this too many times in scriptures, but brother, something lit up on the inside of Jesus. So be careful when people say, what would Jesus do? Because flipping tables and busting up people is within the realm of what would Jesus do? And so... He goes in and hears these doves in cages and he starts flipping the tables. He starts throwing out the money changers and then your Bible says he releases the dove. The dove was in the house but in a cage. Is this not a picture of a lot of churches today? The dove is in the house but we got him in a cage. Don't let the dove out. He might disturb somebody. We have a mayor in the service today. We have, we have politicians. We have famous people in the service. Don't let the dove out. Keep them in a cage. 
People may think we're crazy if that dove gets out. People may think we've lost our minds if that dove gets out. You know, when the Apostle Paul started talking about the Holy Ghost, he only gave us two commands, only two. The first command he gave about the Holy Ghost is he said, do not grieve the Holy Ghost. There is a breed of doves known as mourning doves, as in the emotion, mourning. And these doves make a cooing sound when they, when they begin to um, uh, not chirp, but when they make their sound, it's a ghostly, sad, sorrowful coo. And Paul said, when you sin against God, when you sin against the purpose that God put on the inside of you, hear the sound of the mourning dove. Hear the dove crying over you. Why? Because that dove knows the purpose God put on the inside of you. And he cries and he weeps over you because he knows where this sin would take you. He knows where your life is going to end up if you keep going this direction. It's a sin in thought, a sin in ambition, a sin in the attitude of the heart. It's a sin that undermines my purpose. This goes to your character. And this morning dove, he is, he is weeping over you. He is crying over you because he knows God has so much more in store of you. And Paul said, don't push away that grieving of the Holy Ghost when you sin. And then he says this. He says, don't quench the Holy Ghost. And I started thinking about quench. You know, when you're a little boy, a garden hose can keep you busy all day. And they put this, they put this little lever on the end of this hose. And when I turn it on, See, I got a good flow of water here. Good flow of water, but all I gotta do is turn this and it shuts the water off. Then when I open it, oh, there's another big rush. You know what we call this rush? Hey church, we're having a revival this week. We hope everybody shows up. See, what you do is you keep the Holy Ghost in a cage. You keep them shut off all year long. Then you give them one week and say, we're gonna have a revival. That's what happens right there. He is not a Holy Ghost that's supposed to be turned on on some Sundays and off on other Sundays. No, what we should be doing is turning on and getting in the flow of the Holy Ghost. We should want, we should want the power of the Holy Ghost flowing in every single service. Don't put the Holy Ghost in a cage. Don't turn off the power of God. The reason some churches aren't seeing miracles is because they got the dove in a cage. The reason some churches aren't seeing deliverance is because they got the dove in a cage. But I want to say as City Gate Church, we love the dove. Give him big praise today. We set limits on the Holy Ghost. How do I quench the spirit whenever you re relegate him to a feeling? It's not a feeling. Oh, I got goosebumps. That's the Holy Ghost. No, he's not a feeling. He will make you feel, but he's not a feeling. We quench the spirit when we suppress spiritual gifts. When you begin to suppress, no, 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 we don't want gifts flowing in here today. You've quenched the spirit. We quench the spirit when we instill fear in the hearts of people regarding a legitimate experience and heartfelt emotions and affections in worship. When you tell people, you need to calm down. You need to settle down. You don't need to act up like that in our worship service. You just quenched the spirit. Everybody's not going to act the same way when the Holy Ghost starts flowing. Some people are going to cry, some are going to jump, some are going to spin, some are going to roll in the floor, some are just going to rejoice and laugh. But don't turn it off. Don't put the Holy Ghost in a cage because you're afraid of what somebody else might think. Yeah, but I, I got friends coming this Sunday. Pastor, do you think you could just turn it down for one Sunday? Just one? Let me tell you something about your friends. They got problems, just like everybody else has got problems. 
And when they have a diagnosis of sickness and they watch somebody get healed by the power of the Holy Ghost, they'll be the next person standing down in the aisle because when you've done all you can, you're still looking for one more option. And I got the last option. It's the Holy Ghost. And he is the option above all other options. And he can save, he can deliver, and he can heal. Heard a story of this pastor. And he was nervous because he had this one one old boy that sat on the front row. And every service, man, this old boy would get turned up and off he would go jumping. He'd be shouting, woo, right in the middle of service. He'd get excited. And the pastor knew that the mayor of the city was coming to the service. So he goes to this, this old boy and he says, um, look, I love your enthusiasm. I love how excited you get every Sunday. Now this, this old, old fella, he liked cowboy boots, but he had an old pair. And the pastor goes to him and he says, if you will just be quiet for one Sunday, just one Sunday, I'm going to take you out and I'm going to buy you the nicest pair of cowboy boots you've ever seen. And so the old boy went, okay. He comes in, he sits on the front row, the music starts, and one leg goes to twitching. <laughs> but he didn't move. Then they sang another song like, can't nobody do me like Jesus, and the other leg started twitching. And oh, he started feeling it, and they kept on singing, they kept on singing, and that old boy couldn't take it anymore. He was right next to the mayor, and he jumped up, and he said, Pastor, I'm sorry, but boots or no boots, I gotta praise the Lord. And we need more services like that. We don't need services where we're trying to calm people down. We need services where we're saying, I gotta have a touch of the dove. I gotta have a touch of the Holy Ghost. Today, somebody give God a big praise in this room. Stand with me all over this room. I'm coming to a close. I guess what I'm telling you is, let the dove out. Let's let the dove out. I don't want the dove in a cage. I want to release the dove because I love the dove. I want him to fall on you and I want you to move in spiritual gifts. I want you to begin to experience the power of God in and on your life. I want you to fall in love with the Holy Ghost. Love the dove. Let him out. Open the doors. Let him free. Let him move in the service. Well, what if some, who cares? I promise you once he starts healing people, ain't nobody gonna question how they're acting when they get healed in that moment or how they're talking or what they're doing. When they get a miracle, that's all people are gonna care about. Let the dove out. I heard a story. Royal Air Force during World War II, this plane car carrying several airmen was shot down and it landed in the middle of, uh, I think it was the ocean. This, this plane landed in the ocean. And they couldn't radio in, they couldn't get any help. They were too far out for anyone to hear their calls and their cries. The plane's sinking. These men are breaking out the doors. They're trying to swim out to safety to get to the lifeboat that they had packed in the plane. And one of the men, before he got out of the plane, remembered, we got a pigeon in a cage. It was a carrier pigeon. He Swam back in, got that pigeon out, swam out. They didn't even have time to write the note. They just released the pigeon. They let the dove out. That pigeon flew 120 miles without stopping, landed at the base camp with no note. The mathematicians and scientists started calculating if that pigeon flew from here and the wind was blowing like this and, and this is the direction they were headed, they found those men in the middle of the ocean in 15 minutes. Why? Because somebody let the dove out. They couldn't get help on their own, but when they released the dove, help found them. When you don't know how to pray, the Holy Ghost will pray through you. What does that mean? When I begin to release the dove in my home, when I begin to release the dove in my marriage, the dove goes up to the throne of God and he takes your request to the throne of God and God releases the angels that have your answer, that have your deliverance. He releases warring angels that go to fight for you. 
but you got to release the dove. Love the dove. Now do you see why the devil doesn't want the dove out? Because he knows what will happen if we release the dove. But I pray today, Father, may the Holy Ghost always find freedom in this house because we can't do this without the Holy Ghost. We can't preach without the anointing of the Holy Ghost. We can't sing without the anointing of the Holy Ghost. We can't minister without the anointing of the Holy Ghost. I'm wearied. I'm wearied with people coming to church to see a show. If you came to see me, we're both going to leave disappointed. But if you came to see God, then let me introduce you to the Holy Ghost. Because when God shows up, the Holy Ghost shows out. And that's when lives are changed forever. How many of you love the dove? Raise your hands and just welcome the Holy Ghost in this place right now. I want you to pray that God would give you an awareness of the Holy Spirit like never before. Ask him, God, make me aware of your presence, not just in my life, but make me aware of your presence on my life. I want to know when the Holy Ghost comes on me. I want to know when you're tapping me on the shoulder to provide a miracle to somebody else. Father, may we fall in love with the dove. May we fall in love with the dove in our home, in love with the dove wherever we go. May we have an awareness of the Holy Ghost in our life is my prayer. I give you all the praise and I give you the glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. Do you receive that word today?